Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, in today's webinar, we'll be going through enrolment and progression uh, and the enrolment and written agreement requirements uh, for CRICOS providers. So welcome, everybody. Thank you for attending today. Uh, our second last webinar for the year on compliance. The next one will be um, a very uh, quick and easy one, which will be around uh, enrolment and, uh, not sorry, um, regulatory compliance and governance. Okay, today's session is on enrolment and progression. So we'll be going through standards 5.1, 5.3, 7.3 and 3.5. Uh, with the CRICOS standards, we'll be looking at recruitment of overseas students and we'll be looking at standards uh, 3.1 to 3.6. So we'll be going through those today. So this webinar forms part of your continuous improvement process as we have set out under standard 2.2 uh, within the standards for RTOs. Following this webinar, we recommend that you hold a quality and compliance meeting and include in your minutes that you attended this webinar. And what you should also do is review any policies, procedures, forms or documentation that may relate to what we have covered today in today's webinar. You should also be looking at your own policies, procedures and what are you doing? Are you uh, in line with what we uh, have within our policies and procedures? Is your process a bit different? If it is, how are you adjusting your training to meet uh, the policies and procedures? Or is your policies and procedures, uh, do they need updating to meet the requirements of the standards? So if you have any questions, please place them in the chat. We'd love to hear any questions you may have that will be relevant uh, to the topics uh, today for enrollment and progression and we are here live to be able to answer those questions for you. So let's get into it. Standards 5.1 and 5.2. So these standards focus on how you will inform and protect your students. This includes the information that you provide to them prior to course commencement. So this is the whole student journey from the beginning, looking at the materials that you are providing them uh, prior to course commencement so that they can make an informed decision about what training that they're doing. It really does assist the student to be able to identify whether you are the right training provider for them. And also as an RTO, it helps you to identify that you have the right students for your RTO. It provides information to the students on your services and what you do provide. Uh, and also additional to the requirements of 4.1, which is all around your marketing, you should, it, it will also include support services and how you'll support the student throughout the training. One of the key important areas when it comes to this standard yeah, or these standards within the legislation is ensuring that you're providing accurate advice and that it's clear and transparent on all of your marketing material what you're providing to the student, but also what the student needs to know prior to course commencement. This includes all of your fees and uh, work placement if that is a requirement. So be clear and transparent. How long will the course take? What is required to study? Is there any prerequisites or co-requisites? Are there any work experience requirements? Are there any conditions that you have? in order for them to enrol into this training. What is included within the course, as in uh, what, policy, uh, what documentation, do you have student handbooks, do you have uh, assessment tools, do you have equipment that you provide? And more importantly, what is not provided? So if the student is required to provide something, it needs to be clear on your marketing what that is. For example, if you require the students to study from home, they're going to require steady internet, a laptop or a digital device. They're also going to need access to the internet. So you've got to look at well, what equipment do they need to have in place? If they're required to do work placement, what are they required to wear on work placement? Are they required to wear safety boots if they're working in commercial cookery? Are they required to wear certain colors of clothing? Uh, when they're at work placement. So it needs to be clear on all of your marketing materials beforehand 
so that they can identify, okay, these are all the things that I'm going to need to have in place before I uh, start this course. What is required for assessment? Are they required to do assessment all in the classroom or will there be assessments in the workplace? Will there be assessments conducted at another venue with, that you may have? Are there practical assessments that the students would be required to attend? Okay, so the other one is, is it a requirement that they need to do work placement? What are the requirements for work placement? Who will find the work placement? Is it the RTO's responsibility to find the work placement for the student? Or will the student be required to find the workplace for themselves? Now, we often hear a bit of confusion around this area. An RTO does not have to provide work placement for the student, but they do need to assist and they do need to be clear what is the process. Will it be that you provide a list of providers that they could apply for work placement? Or is it that the student needs to source their own work placement? Or do they have an option? If you do provide work placement, do they have the option, if they, are, they may already have a provider that they may want to go to? Do they have the option to be able to uh, go to their own provider? So it needs to be clear on all of your marketing material prior to course commencement. So what we mean by prior to course commencement is prior to enrollment, so that they know before they pay any fees, what are all of the requirements for your training? So the big thing is, and this is something that ASQA have identified, there is a high risk of dropouts in your training. So withdrawals or cancellation of the training when you do not provide sufficient information to the student prior to course commencement. And this has a direct impact on not only your, you as an RTO, but also when you go to myskills.gov.au, it'll show your dropout rates in there. It will also come up if, in your government funding if you have a high dropout rate. If you want to apply for government funding, they will want to have a look at your commencement to completion rates to identify whether you're a suitable provider. So you want to make sure that you've got the rights people in the right seats on your bus, being your RTO. You want to make sure that they have the skills and knowledge required in order to complete the training, but you also want to make sure that they understand what are their responsibilities when it comes to the delivery of this training and how assessment's going to be conducted. So how to meet these requirements? As a member of Vivacity, you've got access to a range of documentation. You also have access to these webinars where we inform you on your, of your right, rights and responsibilities. So what we have is we have a course flyer template. You can certainly use your own course flyer and marketing material, but we also have a course flyer checklist or a marketing checklist that you can access to make sure that you meet all of the requirements. As a minimum, this is how we cover all of the requirements of the key requirements that need to be in your marketing material prior to course commencement. And that is your course flyer, your enrollment agreement form, the student handbook, and what should be on your website. So as I said, we've got that checklist that you can use to ensure that you meet all the requirements. It should be clear the course title and code of your training products that you are delivering. And if you're a CRICOS provider, that you also have the CRICOS code with your course code uh, and, uh, sorry, the code and title of the training product. It should be very clear prior to course commencement where they will be doing the training, so the locations of the training. It should also include the length of the training, what's required for face-to-face -face training, what's required for self-paced learning or online learning? Uh, what is the mode of delivery? Are you doing a combination? Are you doing face-to-face? -face? Are you doing online? Are you doing work-based uh, training? You need to be very clear with that on your materials. Now that should be at least on your course flyer. You can also have it on your website, but the more clear and transparent you are around all of these areas, the minimal risk that you'll have of dropouts. If you have any third party arrangements, so such as you may have another training provider coming in, delivering one of the units within your training. 
A good example of this is first aid. Often RTOs will hire another company to come and do deliver the first aid units uh, for the training within their qualifications uh, due to the uh, amount of money it costs for all of the equipment, tools and equipment. So do you have any third parties? Is it clear on your marketing uh, who they, those third parties are and what are the requirements that they, the student needs to meet for that third party? A third party could also be where you have a licensed outcome. So the student may be required to do the training, uh, as, get the certificate, and then use that certificate to then go get a license. For example, responsible surface of alcohol. There is a requirement following completion of your training that they need to do in order to get their license or their RSA license. And that includes a fee and where they've got to go to to get that license. And are there any other requirements that they need to meet? That should also be clear on all of your marketing prior to course commencement. And this will also minimise the risk of students dropping out. What are your entry requirements? How are you ensuring that the student understands what they need to know prior to undertaking this training? What are the entry requirements when it comes to work or age or might be other licence requirements that they may need to have? They may need to have completed some other training prior to course commencement as well. What support services will you provide and how will you support the student throughout their training? How are you going to identify what those support services are for that individual student and how you're going to meet those individual needs? So this could include a language literacy and numeracy assessment to identify what are the core skills that the student has and what support they could possibly need. All course fees need to be clear and transparent prior to course commencement. So what I mean by this is not just your tuition fees. Do you charge any additional fees? Are they things such as they have to buy their own uh, textbooks? Do they need to buy a uniform? Will they be required to have a laptop or a digital device? What other things uh, will the students be up for? What will they need to pay for to, in order to complete this course your training successfully. You will also need to identify in your marketing materials, do you have a reassessment fee? And how much is that reassessment fee? And making sure that it's clear and transparent to the students what that reassessment fee, if they, uh, for example, if you're doing forklift driving, what, uh, what is the reassessment fee for them to come back in and do an assessment again on the forklift truck? So you need to have all of your additional fees. Uh, if you are providing government funding, what are the requirements around government funding? Is there an administration fee? Do they need to meet a minimum requirement in order to achieve the government funding or access the government funding? What are those requirements? So it may be an age, it may be uh, a sector that they're working in. Uh, so you need to make sure that you are making it transparent what are the contract requirements for your government funding for the students in order for them to enrol? The other one is consumer rights and the right to a cooling off period. Uh, I often see that there are a lot of marketing materials that are out there or student handbooks where it's not clear to the student that they have the right to a cooling off period. And the cooling off period is really set by each state. So you need to have a look at your state requirements when it comes to a cooling off period. This, uh, the overall across Australia, it's 10 working days that they have the right to be able to withdraw from a course prior to course commencement. If they've already commenced the training, then that cooling off period is waived. But you need to make sure that it's clear and transparent on all of your marketing what that cooling off period is and also your terms and conditions of enrolment. So something you should do following this webinar is conduct an audit of your website. Last month, we covered marketing. So it might be a good idea if you didn't attend last month's webinar to also have a look at that webinar that was recorded and now on Vivacity Training, which is all around marketing. And what I do is I actually look at a couple of social media sites and I also look at some websites 
to show you the difference between what is compliant and what is not compliant. You should really be having a look at those, but also conducting an audit of all of your marketing material. And the best way to do it, and this is what we do when we do an audit, is all of the information that you provide to the student prior to course commencement and review all of that to make sure that it has sufficient information to make it clear and transparent to the student. Now you can use the marketing checklist, which is available on Unicorn, that you can check all of your marketing materials. So we also have an enrollment agreement form. Now I know that we've got some clients on here who do use our enrollment agreement form, and then there are others who have chosen to use their own enrollment form. On our enrollment agreement form, we've covered everything that you need to provide to the student prior to course commencement. So if you remove anything from that enrollment form, you're at risk of being non-compliant. So you need to make sure that you're covering as a minimum what I've got up on the screen here right now, these terms and conditions. So what are your enrollment and selection requirements? That you have a consumer guarantee and the right to a cooling off period. You are clear and transparent with all of your course fees, payments and refunds, and this includes reassessment fees. Your fee protection, how are you ensuring you're protecting the students uh, with their fees? The cooling off period, as stated earlier, complaints and appeals, their rights to complaints and appeals, and how to conduct a complaint and a comp a appeal or submit one their right to a credit transfer for any units that they may have direct equivalent to within your training and their ability to be able to get a credit transfer for those units. The, the responsibility of the RTO to identify what support services they need to provide for the students through language literacy and numeracy assessments or a minimum entry requirement that will set the student up for success when it comes to their training. Their right to access support services and what that support services looks like within your RTO. Within our policies and procedures, we have a range of systems and practices that you can put into place in order to support your students. And we cover support services in standard 1.7, which we'll be covering in February. Then any other legislative and regulatory requirements uh, required for, as an RTO should also be in there. And then of course, work health and safety. So we have a statement on the back of the enrollment form that is in the terms and conditions of enrollment that covers each of these, and then refers to the student handbook, which has full information about all of these key areas within the student handbook, including how to submit a complaint or an appeal for a result. Also how to access support services. Uh, what are their requirements for reporting a WHS incident? So we cover all of those in our student handbook. So we highly recommend that you either use our enrollment agreement form because we know that it meets the requirements of the standards, or as a minimum, if you're using your own form, that you include all of the information that we have on our enrollment agreement form and then add anything additional that you would like to have on your enrollment agreement form. Also on the enrollment agreement form, it includes confirmation that you as an RTO are responsible for the compliance of all of the training and assessment. You are also responsible for the issuance of any certification against the requirements of the units that you're delivered. So it might be a statement of attainment or a full qualification. It also details how and where they go to to submit a complaint and what that process is. Also the le learner's right to a third party if the RTO ceases to train or if they have the right, uh, what, what is going to happen in, in the event of maybe it could be the trainer, you need to change trainers, it might be you need to change venues. What is that process that you're going to do to ensure that the uh, student understands that they're still going to receive what you agreed to in their terms and conditions? Each student is required to complete an enrollment form prior to course commencement, and they are required to sign it. 
and they need to sign each side of the enrolment agreement form to one is so on ours we have on the front page all of the event miss data and on the back is the terms and conditions on the front they're signing to state that all of the information is true and correct on the front and on the back with the terms and conditions they're signing to agree with the term, your terms and conditions of enrollment then you can have any additional we have another page that is also in the enrollment form that includes uh, basically identifying support services prior to course commencement and how you can support the student throughout their training. So as an RTO with your pre-enrolment information, as a key with as a, a member of Vivacity, you should be looking using the student handbook that is uh, that we provide you for your uh, RTO. Uh, you can certainly make adjustments to it, but every policy and procedure that we have within the student handbook meets the requirements of the standards and the legislation. It also meets the requirements of the quality and compliance manual. So your policies and procedures for running your RTO. So when you remove anything from the student handbook, you need to make sure that you're still addressing the requirements of the standards. So what I recommend, if you want to have your own style of student handbook, utilize everything within our student handbook and then just add any additional information that you would like to have in the student handbook. This is why we provide it to you in a Word document so that you can add your own information within the policies and procedures and then adjust those policies and procedures in accordance with what you actually do as an RTO. We also provide you with an enrolment agreement form. So you should be using that enrolment agreement form. Once again, you can add additional information as required. But as a minimum, we've included all of the key compliance requirements within the enrolment form. We've taken that work away for you and made it easy. Now, if you have additional enrolment requirements for round government funding, you need to make sure that you're adding that to the enrolment form as well but don't take anything away. With the website, that's your responsibility. You need to make sure that your website has true and accurate information. You're not advertising anything that is not on your scope of registration. If you are promoting a course on behalf of another RTO, you need to make sure that you have a third party agreement and that has a whole another set of standards that we need to cover around third parties. So you need to meet all of the third party requirements. So you need to be very careful with what you're marketing on your website and making sure that that also meets the requirements of the standards, because you cannot market a training product that you do not have on your scope of registration. So you need to be really careful in particular when you have superseded training products to make sure that the superseded training products are removed from your website as well. So your website should be reviewed on a regular basis to make sure that it has true and accurate information regularly. Um, we recommend you to conduct an audit at least once a year, but whenever you have a training product change, the first thing you should change is your training and assessment strategy, your delivery and assessment plan, and then your marketing material and making sure that you're updating your marketing material. And this includes any course flyers that you may have be it paper or digital based uh, marketing material. So the student handbook includes the support services, students' rights and responsibilities, and your policies and procedures as an RTO. So it is very clear in there, what is the students' rights and responsibilities? Where do they go to to submit a complaint? And the whole process of sitting, submitting a complaint. You can't just state, that the student has the right to submit a complaint, you need to advise them on what is the process, what will happen once the complaint is submitted, what does the RTO do, how are you going to ensure that the student is kept informed of the whole process and how they're kept up to date. This includes opportunities for improvement where they can identify opportunities for improvement within your organisation to help you improve your training practices. So it should be very clear within your student handbook, what is the process for the students to follow with your uh, policies and procedures? How to submit a complaint and appeal? How to appeal in a res result? 
if they disagree with the result, what is their rights and responsibilities when it comes to that? What are their responsibilities when it comes to work placement? And what are they required to do on work placement? Do you have a uniform requirement? Do you have a requirement for minimum dress standards when they're attending your RTO on site? So it needs to be really, really clear what are the requirements for the student. So students' rights and responsibilities include the right to a cooling off period, the right to a refund, um, and what is your refund policy and procedure as well. Uh, also, reassessment fees. So if you charge a reassessment fee, what is that reassessment fee? And how many times are they allowed to uh, have reassessment? Any additional fees that you may have, complaints and appeals, course requirements and prerequisites for undertaking the training. So let's have a quick look at CRICOS now. So looking at how that relates, uh, your pre-enrollment information is your student prospectus, which includes all of the requirements against the standards for the CRICOS standards uh, and making sure that the student is informed of that enrollment process. You also have a written agreement that has the terms and conditions of enrollment that the student is required to understand and agree to. And that includes uh, if they uh, health, health requirements, uh, what is their health insurance, uh, uh, accommodation, and all of, all of the additional fees that may come with that. You also need to make sure that your website is kept up to date and the International Student Handbook, which has different requirements within the policies and procedures that align with the requirements of CRICOS. Within the International Student Handbook, there's also uh, support services, information to assist the student with settling into Australia, and then of course your policies and procedures. Next, we're gonna have a look at fees and refunds. ASQA has reported that they have received, they received a significant number of complaints about fees and refunds, and mainly around insufficient information provided prior to course commencement on what are all of the fees? What are all the requirements for the student in order to complete this training? So it's really, really important that you're making sure that you have it clear on your marketing material prior to course commencement. What are the fees? What is your refund policy? Now you can set your refund policy and what are the requirements? You can charge an administration fee um, if you have a cancellation prior to course commencement. That is your right, but it needs to be clear and transparent on your marketing material prior to course commencement of what are your policies and procedures. And you want to minimise the risk of an ask or audit that could be triggered by a complaint. You definitely do not want a audit that's triggered by a complaint. They also receive complaints about student information prior to course commencement and the enrolment process. So this is where it's really important to make sure that you have all of this information up to date prior to course commencement. So you minimise the risk of the student pulling out from the training and also submitting a complaint. So let's look at standard 5.3, which is course fees, payment and refunds. So where the RTO collects fees from an individual learner, either directly or through a third party, the RTO provides to the student or directs the student to information prior to course commencement about your fees and conditions and your payment terms and conditions and a refund policy. Also the learner's rights to consumer, uh, consumer and statutory cooling off periods. Um, and you need to have a look at your individual states. And if you are delivering in more than one state, you need to adjust for each state that you're delivering in. So you're making sure that you meet the requirements in each of those states. Also the learner's rights to obtain a refund for services not provided by the RTO. For example, if the training arrangement was terminated early or there was a change in trainer assessor or change in location, what is your process for that? Now we have this covered within the Q&C manual. So you can have a look at what that process is. We also have it in the student handbook of how you will notify the student of any of those changes. So make sure that you're up to speed with what those policies and procedures are that we have in our manuals so that you are ensuring that you're complying with those requirements. 
So within our policies and procedures, we have course fees and refunds and the payments. So you may need to contextualize that for your RTO. We also have the cooling off period and the standard payment plan process that we have is they do not pay more than $1,500 prior to course commencement and then have increments of $1,500. Now, this doesn't apply for CRICOS. There's a different process for CRICOS, but we've used this one. There are a range of other uh, fee protection measures that you can put in place. We've got this one in the policy and procedure manual. If you have a different type of fee protection, you need to make sure that you're updating the Q&C manual, the student handbook, as well as the enrollment form where all of these are covered within there. If you are doing the standard fee protection, which is no more than $1,500 prior to course commencement, you're fine. All of the policies and procedures are already in place. So we have a refund request form that the students uh, can use. And we also state that within the student handbook, the, the process for accessing a refund or applying for a refund, we also have it in the Q&C manual. So you should be going on to Unicorn and downloading the refund request form, reviewing it, making sure that it actually aligns with your process as well. You might, want, you might have a slightly different process that you may need to adapt with this form. Or you don't have a process at the moment, you need to make sure that you're implementing this form and that it's easy for the student to access. All of our forms, you can adapt to an online form. If you prefer an online form, you can just, as long as you follow the same process, so the fields that we have within the form, you can create that within an online form and we keenly encourage online forms. It does make life easier for everyone. Um, and we recommend that you keep to the fields that we have on our forms. Uh, the main reason why is because we know that it's compliant. So uh, within our policies and procedures, we outline all of your uh, refund policies and your payment policies, and we're making sure that it keeps it clear and transparent. The last thing you want is surprises. You don't want to add additional fees onto your training and assessment. This is where a lot of RTOs get into trouble because it's not clear and transparent prior to course commencement of all the fees that they may incur. So for example, you may have an excursion or you may have uh, something that the student needs to purchase as part of their training. So you need to make sure that that's clear prior to course commencement because they need to know what are all of those fees up front. In particular, if you've got a student who's coming through a job active provider, because the job active provider often more than not will pay for those additional fees. So it's good if those fees are clear and transparent up front so the student can access that through the job active provider on, on commencement. Uh, you need to ensure all of your marketing material is clear and transparent with all of this information. Um, we've gone through consumer guarantee um, and that you will ensure, so this is what our policy and procedure has in, against the requirements of fair trading, that you'll provide training in good due care and skill. Uh, that it's fit for any specified purpose, in particular, the industry that you're delivering. You give students access to the equipment that is required in order for them to complete that training. Um, you also give them all of access to everything that they need in order to complete their assessments uh, and their training, of course. Uh, and that it's going to be provided within a reasonable time period. So you, that's why it's very important that it's clear on your marketing material what your time period is. And then the consequences um, if the guarantee is not met and refers the student to the policies and procedures around complaints and appeals. Here is the fee protection policy. So this is, we, we have elected to use the $1,500 prior to course commencement uh, fees, but you can also uh, amend that if you have another fee protection policy that you've uh, got confirmed through ASWA. So fees include all of the fees that the students is required to pay. Uh, it's clear and transparent on all of your marketing material and that you've met the requirements for the threshold for prepaid fees. Uh, as a CRICOS provider, you can access or your students can access tuition assurance scheme where their fees are protected through the assurance scheme. 
So uh, as I stated, we have used the $1,500 prior to course commencement, but there are a couple of other fee protection measures that you can put into place. You could have a bank guarantee. So a bank guarantee is where the uh, bank will guarantee all fees. So if you collect all of the fees in advance, you would have the money placed into a trust account and draw down on that money throughout the process of the course. For example, no more than $1,500 prior to course commencement and then draw down $1,500 increments. Um, and you need to get this approved through ASQA if you are going to go down the bank guarantee path. Uh, tuition assurance scheme is one that is used for CRICOS providers. Um, and what it is, is that you, it's like an insurance scheme um, and you are protected as an RTO and also the students are protected in the event if there's um, any, a closure of the RTO, uh, could be COVID um, and different circ circumstances that could affect your tuition and the fees that are paid in advance. Okay, on to clause 3.5, which is credit transfer. All students have the right to a credit transfer for prior studies. So this includes any training that is conducted with a registered training provider, training organisation, including TAFE and private providers. So you need to make sure it's clear on your marketing that they have the right to a credit transfer for single units uh, that they may have completed before. So within a, the student handbook, uh, we outline the, that the student is eligible to apply for a credit transfer and what the process is for applying. Uh, the student, can, we have a credit transfer form that the student completes and submits to the RTO and that they are required to provide original certificates or a copy that is signed by a justice of the peace um, of any certificates uh, and certifications that they may have. Uh, and this is also on the back of the enrolment form is their right to a credit transfer. So this is the form that you can access on Unicorn. Once again, you can do this as an electronic form if you would prefer. Uh, so you basically keep the same fields. The way that we do it is you get the student to complete their details, uh, the units that they wish to uh, transfer across. So it could be in an event that they commenced a full qualification with another RTO, or they may have done a pre-bop where they completed four units that are direct equivalents to the units that you are delivering within your RTO, and then they need to provide evidence of that. So they should provide a transcript of the original or one that has been certified by a justice of the peace, uh, and that you can verify those records. You should also verify on the USI register, so the unique student identifier register, uh, if they've completed the training since 2015, uh, it should be on the register. Uh, and you need to keep a record of that transcript on file as well. So you can do an electronic copy that is applied to the students uh, in with the uh, information within the database. Uh, and then, uh, the process, we're going to check this afterwards. So the units are a direct equivalent. Uh, they are eligible for the credit transfer. The student has been notified in writing of the outcome of the credit transfer and the trainer has been uh, notified in writing that the student is eligible for a credit transfer. So when you collect a copy of the student's certificate, so the, if they produce an original copy, as an RTO, you can take a photocopy of that uh, statement of attainment and certify it yourself. You don't need to be a JP as an RTO if you cite the original certificate. So you should have a stamp, something like this, certified true copy of an original document and someone who is a permanent employee of the RTO should sign it and date it. And that's the record that you would keep and you would uh, scan that copy and make sure that you've got it on your database uh, for your student management system. If you have received a copy from a, uh, where it's been certified by a JP, you'll need to have something like this. So they've got a stamp, they've got their JP number, or if they're a police officer, uh, they've got their police ID on there. So there's different ways you can get certified copies of, um, and it may be of a license that they hold already. So for example, 
Uh, they might be doing a hospitality qualification. They already hold the RSA uh, uh, license. So it might be that you're certifying that they hold the license so they can get a credit transfer for the unit that they completed in RSA. Um, you do need to look at the individual state requirements, uh, in particular with around things around RSA. Uh, also, security licensing has different requirements in different states. So you need to make sure you're complying with each of the licensing requirements. But anywhere where you're taking a certified copy, making sure that it is certified by someone who is allowed to certify documentation. Uh, we've already gone through the course fees, but we also have that uh, refund request form that the students can use as well. Make sure you're downloading that. Uh, when we go look at CRICOS, uh, with regards to CRICOS, you have a written agreement. Uh, it's very similar to the enrolment form, except within the written agreement, it meets the requirements of the CRICOS uh, standards, and it also includes all of the fees up front, so it's clear and transparent what they are, the order of the units that they will be undertaking, uh, the CRICOS code for the training product that you are delivering as well, so it's really clear on there. Um, if the students or intending overseas student is under the age of 18, that you have a written agreement with the overseas student's um, legal guardian or parent, um, making sure that that is clear on there as well. The written agreement form uh, includes the enrolment application form, a letter of offer, and then the confirmation of enrolment. So if we've got any uh, CRICOS providers, and I'm just seeing whether we do. Uh, yes, we do have a couple on here today, uh, CRICOS providers. So uh, you need to make sure all of these are included within your uh, agreement forms. We have an enrolment uh, application form for our CRICOS uh, uh, clients. So it needs to be completed by any person wishing to enrol. Uh, if it's going to be completed on, be with, uh, on behalf of the student with an education agent, they need to make sure that the student is signing the form, not the education agent. And it should be clear that the education agent assisted them with the completion of the form. So you need to have some sort of mechanism in place if an education agent is going to assist the student with completing the form that is clear on the form that they had assisted them. It outlines the provider's relevant policies and procedures and refers to the international student prospectus. Um, and this form is the first form the potential student may complete and determines whether they meet the entry requirements of the training. And they need to accept their letter of offer. So you provide a letter of offer and they accept the letter of offer by signing the form or having a legal guardian if they're under the age of 18. Uh, if they have uh, consecutive courses, so overseas students may be enrolled into a number of courses and it may not be at your uh, RTO, it may be with another RTO or a university. Uh, so you may need to have separate agreements uh, for each separate course. Uh, so you don't, don't need to as the one provider, but they may have for different providers. If the terms of the agreement are the same for all courses, the provider may have one single written agreement. So letter of offer covering all of the courses. Uh, the terms and conditions for each course must be clearly identified within the letter of offer. And uh, standard 3.3 in accordance with the ESOS Act is at making sure that it's clear and transparent, same as the standards for RTOs, that the student understands their rights and responsibilities and what are they enrolling into and what are the requirements. Um, as an addition for international students, it's their requirement for English language requirements. So it may be um, uh, ELICOS, if you're doing ELICOS training, or an IELTS score that they need to have in order to uh, meet the entry requirements of the training. Uh, and you need to be clear and transparent with all of your fees up front. Uh, with this one, they, the student has the right uh, to access the Commonwealth, including uh, Commonwealth fees, including tuition protection scheme. Uh, and you also need to have a look at the individual state or territory requirements in accordance with the Privacy Act. Uh, and you need to have an internal and external policy and procedure uh, requirement as per the standards for RTOs as well. 
um, and state that the student is responsible for keeping any copies of written agreements. Uh, this applies to domestic students as well. Um, if they want a copy of the enrolment form, it is their responsibility to keep a copy of the enrolment form. Um, and only use links to provide supplementary materials. Uh, these are very similar to what I've already covered. Uh, so it's making sure that the student is well informed prior to course commencement. I'm just uh, as same with refund policies. Uh, the main difference is the English language requirements and making sure that it's in um, simple English. So all of your documentation is in simple English. So it's easy for the student to understand. And also the student's right to take action under the Australian consumer law if the Australian consumer law applies. Uh, and we've already gone through the written agreements. Uh, we have the International Student Handbook, which covers all of the policies and procedures around the international student requirements. Uh, we also have the payment of fees, so they must not pay any fees unless the agreement has been accepted. Uh, and fees for tuition and non-tuition fees can be paid at the same time when the agreement is accepted. This applies for both RTOs, uh, so domestic and international students. It is a higher requirement within uh, for international students that they keep you up to date because they're more likely to be moving around, changing address, changing phone numbers whilst they're in Australia. So you need to make sure that they are informing you of any changes to their residential address, their email addresses, their contact in, emer in emergency situations, um, and they need to give you up-to-date details within seven days of that change. On Unicorn, you can access a change of an address details form that they can complete and provide it to the RTO that gives, them, gives you the information of any of those updated details. Once again, this can be an electronic form that you can use. The registered provider must retain records of all written agreements as well as receipts of payments made by students under the written agreement for at least two years after the person ceases to be accepted as an international student. So this is an international student requirement. For domestic market, uh, your enrolment will be recorded within the student management system. So you'll have that within your student management system. Written agreements must be securely stored by the provider as well as receipts for payments made under the written agreement for at least two years under the student, um, uh, after the student ceases training. Okay, so we've gone through all of the requirements now for the standards. Um, we're easing into the end of the year now. Uh, just like to ask right now, do you have any questions? Do we have any questions? concerns, roadblocks, uh, you can pop them in the chat uh, that are is around enrollment and progression. And uh, while I'm waiting for any questions that may be submitted on the chat, uh, just a reminder, the strategic planning retreat is coming up on the 25th and 26th of November. If you're a superhero member, you get this included as part of your membership. If you're a sidekick with VIP or elite, you also get one ticket to access the strategic planning retreat. The strategic planning retreat is our biggest event of the year and it's where we plan out your next 12 months for 2022. We have some exciting uh, stuff that's going to be happening at, happening at the strategic planning retreat, including we've got some keynote speakers who will be attending. We've got the author of the 90-day business goal tracker who will be speaking at the event and will also be getting access, you'll be getting this book as part of the retreat uh, documentation where we'll be tracking your goals for the next 90 days, for the first 90 days of 2022. Um, and Romney Nelson will also be speaking about how to implement this within your organisation. I'll also be uh, putting into the training uh, how to uh, implement this as an RTO. We also have a guest speaker who will be speaking uh, about Profit First. So this is the business side of your RTO and looking at 
your finances within your organisation and making sure that we're putting profit first into your organisation. So this is really good uh, for the finance side, managing budgets. Uh, it may not be just for the head of the RTO, it might be the head of a department and managing budgets within your department. So this uh, is relevant for that as well. You'll be also getting a copy of this book, uh, Profit First. Uh, I am currently going through the process of certification as a Profit First coach, and I will be uh, delivering training and using my Profit First uh, skills and knowledge, and we already, I already do, in the masterminds that we hold every Monday. So every Monday at 10.30 a.m., we have our mastermind for all of our superhero and VIP members uh, where you can access um, coaching for you and your RTO. And we do cover profit first in there as well. Uh, the masterminds have been crucial as part of leading up to the strategic planning retreat. If you've never attended a mastermind before or maybe only once or twice in the past, I recommend you get onto the masterminds in future because we are doing all of our planning for the strategic planning retreat leading up to the 25th and 26th of November. It's a really important process is everything that we're doing leading up to the retreat because it's going to prepare you and your RTO to be in the best position for 2022. We also have on Vivacity Training, a course that is called Get Ready to Launch 2022 Strategic Planning Retreat. And there is training on there on preparation, so pre-retreat uh, course uh, training for you. We also will have the recordings of the retreat and we'll also have following the retreat, a course that you can access on there. We've had a number of clients uh, get in contact with us and ask us, will we have to share all of our private and confidential information as an RTO with everybody else? No, you won't. Every individual RTO will have their own breakout room where you'll be brainstorming your individual goals for 2022. So you don't need to, we won't be breaching any privacy and confidentiality requirements. You'll have access to your own breakout room where the Vivacity team will be jumping into those individual rooms and assisting you with planning for the future. So the training will be everybody together, but you'll have your individual breakout rooms where you can chat about um, your individual goals and strategies for 2022. Highly recommend you get onto the training on Vivacity Training, uh, but also that you get along to the Masterminds 10.30 every Monday. Next Wednesday, we will be covering, I will be covering all of the eight critical drivers, which is also a requirement for the strategic planning retreat. So if you haven't attended any of the critical driver training, highly recommend you get onto this one. It's held on the second Wednesday of every month um, on Zoom at 10 a.m. And you've been sent an invite for that. Uh, I'm not sure, I think Kira is online. If you can just pop in the chat the ad event. No, she's not there, I don't think. Uh, nope, uh, you should, when you go on to Vivacity Training, you'll see the ad event and you'll be able to um, access the calendar on there. Uh, the calendar is within there. You can also access um, all of our events are in there. Highly recommend you get onto that. Uh, with the strategic planning retreat, it's a really good idea. If you haven't registered yet to register now, the retreat packs are going out this week and you must register in order to attend. If you do not register, we are assuming you're not coming and are not sending retreat packs out to anybody who um, is not going to be attending the retreat. So this is, uh, I'm just gonna share with you now, Vivacity Training, uh, just so you can see where uh, you can access all of the information about the strategic planning retreat. So when you go into Vivacity Training, we've got in the menu down the left-hand side, strategic planning retreat. You can go into there, there's information about um, your pre-retreat um, checklist on what you need to do and you can register here. So there's a register uh, button there. I'm just gonna pop that in the chat so you can also register now. So if you are a superhero member, you can have, uh, depending on your membership level, diamonds have unlimited. Um, if you are Ruby, 
uh, it depends on how many uh, user access you have. If you're a, a sidekick and you're a VIP and elite, you get this included as part of your membership. So you should register now. Um, if you are not, if you're a basic um, uh, sidekick, there is a fee uh, for registering for the retreat and there's a different link for that. We will be checking all of these, of course, uh, but you just register by filling in your details in here and any additional attendees that you may have. So it's very important that you include the company name, your RTO name, and any additional attendees. If they're not gonna be in the same room as you, we need to be able to provide them a Zoom link because it's all online. The strategic planning retreat is all online. We have some really good interaction that will be happening with the retreat. So something a bit different from what we've been doing before. Uh, so I highly recommend that you get all of your team members uh, registered for this and that they um, have their own Zoom link if they're going to be working from home. If you're going to be in the same room, we're going to have individual breakout rooms still for you there where the Vivacity team will be able to jump in and help you out on the day as well. So each uh, breakout room will be named by the RTO. So each RTO will have their own individual breakout room so that we can assist you but also if you have anybody else attending virtually, virtually, they can also attend the retreat through the breakout room as well and you can brainstorm together. So if you haven't registered yet, highly recommend you jump in. I'll pop, pop the link in the chat uh, for you to register. As I stated, it's not automatic registration. Members must register. And the reason why is you're getting all these delivered to you and I'm not going to send out boxes to people who are not going to attend the retreat because this is all relevant to the retreat. So if you want to attend the retreat, make sure you register now. Um, and these packs are coming out this week. So we need to have all of those details this week so that we can get those packs sent out to you. It is the biggest event of the year. We've got some very exciting stuff that's coming up. So I highly recommend that you get onto the retreat. Okay, lastly, the next webinar is on the 6th of December, our last one for the year. It's a nice, easy one. We're going through regulatory compliance and governance, um, and it's just in general compliance with the uh, variety of legislation that we need to comply with, um, and we'll be making it nice and easy for the end of the year. So two more months before we end this year, and I'm hoping everyone's looking forward to an amazing 2022 because I know we are, and we have so much in store for you for 2022. You thought 2021, you got a lot. There is more coming in 2022. Um, if you haven't accessed it yet, we also have the Vivacity Training app. So you can go onto the App Store, uh, so Apple App Store or Google Play Store, and you can access the Vivacity Training app. So you just uh, search the Vivacity Training app and your current Vivacity Training login details will get you into the app. So you'll be able to log in through the app and there's some great things on the app that you can access as well. So if you haven't uh, accessed the app yet, just search Vivacity Training, we're the only ones on there, um, download the app. Uh, you can access all of your training on there, but there's also some additional things that we have on there like forums and groups um, and updates about what's happening at uh, Vivacity. Uh, we're slowly going to be fading out the Facebook group next year, the Vivacity Facebook group, because Vivacity Training, we have our own social network on there. So we'll be doing all of our updates on there um, and you'll be able to access them all there. We're just doing a transition at the moment, uh, but next year we'll be do a full transition from the Facebook group where everything will be through the app and you'll be able to access it on your phone and you'll also be able to access it through Vivacity Training. That's it for today. Where can I register for Wednesday? Uh, that was the ad event that you would have had for Wednesday. So Paul, don't worry, I've noted it. Um, I'll make sure that you're registered. You'll get a reminder anyway. Um, with the eight critical drivers, all members are automatically registered for the eight critical driver masterclasses. So it's just the same as this one. Uh, they're auto automatically uh, registered and you just attend the ones that you want to attend. So I hope that uh, fills you in there, Paul, uh, and that you're up to date there. Any other questions, concerns? Otherwise, this is us for today. And I look forward to seeing you at next week's uh, Eight Critical Drivers Masterclass. 
Uh, and I also look forward to catching up with you at the strategic planning retreat. Um, we have opened this up to the public as well, so other RTOs, and we'll only be taking 50 registrations. So whether you're a member or not, we'll only be taking 50. We're up to 27 already. So if you haven't registered yet, make sure that you are registering uh, because we have got uh, the public who are joining us for the strategic planning retreat as well. Um, highly recommend that you get registered now. All right, that's so long from me right now. Look forward to catching up with you again soon. Have an awesome week and I'll catch you later.